the conventional chitta, the chitta released. Once the chitta has been well cleansed so that it's constantly radiant, then when we're in a quiet place without any sounds, for instance, late in the still of the night, even if the chitta hasn't gathered in samadhi, we find that when we focus on that center of awareness, it is so exceedingly delicate and refined that it's hard to describe. This refinement then becomes like a radiance that spreads all around us in every direction. Nothing appears to be making contact with the senses of sight, hearing, smell, taste, and feeling at that moment, even though the jitta hasn't gathered into the factors of samadhi. Instead, this is the firm foundation of the jitta that has been well cleansed and displays a striking awareness, magnificence, and sensitivity within itself. With this type of awareness, it's as if we weren't dwelling in a body at all. This is a very refined awareness, pronounced within itself. Even though the jitta hasn't gathered in samadhi, still, because of the refinement of the jitta, because of the pronounced nature of the jitta, it becomes a pronounced awareness without any visions or images appearing at all. This awareness is preeminent exclusively in itself. This is one stage of the jitta. Another stage is when this well-cleansed jitta gathers into stillness, not thinking, not forming any thoughts at all. It rests from its activity, its rippling. All thought formations within the jitta rest completely. All that remains is simple awareness, which is called the jitta entering into stillness. Here even more so, nothing appears at all. All that appears is awareness, as if it were blanketing the entire cosmos, because the currents of the jitta aren't like the currents of light. The currents of light have their end, near or far, depending on the strength of the light. For example, with electric light, if the candle power is high, it will shine for a long distance. If low, it will shine for a short distance. But the currents of the jitta aren't like that. They have no near or far. To put it simply, there is no time or place. The jitta can blanket everything. Far is like near. Near, far, they don't really apply. All that appears is that awareness blanketing everything to the ends of the universe. It's as if all that appears in the entire world is this single awareness. As if there were nothing in our consciousness at all even though everything still exists as it always has. This is what it's like. The power of the jitta, the current of the jitta that has been cleansed of things that cloud and obscure it. Even more so when the jitta is completely pure. This is even harder to describe. I wouldn't know how to define it because it's not something to be defined. It's not something that can be expressed like conventional things in general because it's not a conventional reality. It lies solely within the range of those who are non-conventional, who know their own non-conventionality. For this reason, it can't be described. Now, the world is full of conventions. Whatever we say, we need to use a conventional picture, a supposition, to make comparisons in every case. It seems like this, it seems like that, or it's like this, it's like that, it's similar to that. For example, take the word Nibbana. Ordinary Kilesa, our ordinary Jitta, requires that we think of Nibbana as broad and spacious, with nothing appearing in it. But we forget that the word Nibbana, which is a conventional word, still has some conventionality to it. We might even think that there's nothing in Nibbana but pure people milling around, both men and women, because they both can reach purity. Nibbana has nothing but those who are pure, milling around to and fro, or sitting around in comfort and peace, without being disturbed by sadness, discontent, or loneliness, as we are in our conventional world so full of turmoil and dukkha. Actually, we don't realize that this picture of pure men and women milling or sitting around happily at their leisure without anything disturbing them, is simply a convention that can't have anything to do with the release of actual Nibbana at all, 
when we talk about things that are beyond the range of convention, even though they may not be beyond the range of the speaker's awareness, even though they may be well within that person's range, they can't be expressed in conventional terms. Whatever is expressed is bound to be interpreted wrongly, because ordinarily the jitta is always ready to be wrong, or continues to be wrong within itself. As soon as anything comes flashing out, we have to speculate and guess in line with our incorrect and uncertain understanding. Like Venerable Yamaka saying to Venerable Sariputta that an arahant no longer exists after death. Venerable Yamaka was still an ordinary, run-of-the-mill person. But even though Venerable Sariputta, who was an arahant, tried to explain things to him, he still wouldn't understand until the Lord Buddha had to come and explain things himself. Even then, if I'm not mistaken, Venerable Yamaka still didn't understand in line with the truth the Buddha explained to him. As I remember, the texts say that Venerable Yamaka didn't attain any of the paths and fruitions or Nibbana or anything. Still, there must have been a reason for the Buddha's explanation. If there were nothing to be gained by teaching, the Buddha wouldn't teach. In some cases, even when the person being taught didn't benefit much from the Tamma, other people involved would. This is one of the traits of the Lord Buddha. There had to be a reason for everything he'd say. If there was something that would benefit his listeners, he'd speak. If not, he wouldn't. This is the nature of the Buddha. Fully reasonable, fully accomplished in everything of every sort. He wouldn't make empty pronouncements in the way of the rest of the world. So when he spoke to Venerable Yamaka, I'm afraid I've forgotten the details because it's been so long since I read it, to the point where I've forgotten who benefited on that occasion, or maybe Venerable Yamaka did benefit. I'm not really sure. At any rate, let's focus on the statement, an arahant doesn't exist after death, as the important point. The Buddha asked, is the arahant his body so that when he dies he is annihilated with the body? Is he Vedana, Sanya, Sankara, Vinyarna? Is he earth, water, wind, or fire so that when he dies he's annihilated with these things? He kept asking in this way until he reached the conclusion that the body is inconstant and so disbands. Vedana, Sanya, Sankara, and Vinyarna are inconstant and so disband. Whatever is a matter of convention follows these conventional ways. But whatever is a matter of release, of purity, cannot be made to follow those ways, because it is not the same sort of thing. To take release or a released jitta and confuse or compound it with the five kanthas, which are an affair of conventional reality, is wrong. It can't be done. The five kanthas are one level of conventional reality. The ordinary jitta is also a level of conventional reality. The refinement of the jitta, so refined that it is marvelous even when there are still things entangling it, displays its marvelousness in line with its level for us to see clearly. Even more so when the things entangling it are entirely gone, the jitta becomes tamma. The tamma is the jitta, the jitta is tamma. The entire tamma is the entire jitta. The entire jitta is the entire tamma. At this point, no conventions can be supposed, because the jitta is pure tamma. Even though such people may still be alive, directing their kanthas, that nature stays that way in full measure. Their kanthas are kanthas, just like ours. Their appearance, manners, and traits appear in line with their characteristics, in line with the affairs of conventional reality that appear in those ways, which is why these things cannot be mixed together to become one with that nature. When the jitta is released, the nature of release is one thing. The world of the kanthas is another world entirely. Even though the pure heart may dwell in the midst of the world of the kanthas, it is still, always, a jitta released. To call it a transcendent jitta wouldn't be wrong, because it lies above conventional reality, above the elements and kanthas. The transcendent tamma is a tamma above the world. This is why people of this sort can know the issue of connection in the jitta. Once the jitta is cleansed stage by stage, they can see its beginning points and end points. They can see the jitta's behavior, the direction towards which it tends most heavily, and whether there is anything left that involves the jitta or acts as a means of connection. These things they know, and they know them clearly, 
when they know clearly, they find a way to cut, to remove from the chitta the things that lead to connection step by step. When the kilesas come thick and fast, there is total darkness in the chitta. When this happens, we don't know what the jitta is or what the things entangling it are, and so we assume them to be one and the same. The things that come to entangle the jitta and the jitta itself become mixed into one, so there's no way to know. But once the jitta is cleansed step by step, we come to know in stages until we can know clearly exactly how much there is still remaining in the jitta. Even if there's just a bit, we know there's a bit because the act of connection lets us see plainly that this is the seed that will cause us to be reborn in one place or another. We can tell this clearly within the jitta. When we know this clearly, we have to try to rectify the situation, using the various methods of mindfulness and banya until that thing is cut away from the jitta with no more connections. The jitta will then become an entirely pure jitta, with no more means of connection or continuation. We can see this clearly. This is the one who is released. This is the one who doesn't die. Our Lord Buddha, from having practiced truly, from having truly known in line with the principles of the truth, seeing them clearly in the heart, spoke truly, acted truly, and knew truly. He taught what he had truly known and truly seen. And so how could he be wrong? At first he didn't know how many times he had been born or what various things he had been born as. Even concerning the present, he didn't know what his jitta was attached to or involved with, because he had many, many gilesas at that stage. But after he had striven and gained awakening so that the entire tamma appeared in his heart, he knew clearly. When he knew clearly, he took that truth to proclaim the Tamma to the world, and with intuitive insight knew who would be able to comprehend this sort of Tamma quickly, as when he knew that the two hermits and the five brethren were already in a position to attain the Tamma. He then went to teach the five brethren and attained the aim he foresaw. All five of them attained the Tamma stage by stage to the level of arahantship. All five of them attained the Tamma stage by stage to the level of Arahantship. Since the Buddha was teaching the truth to those aiming at the truth with their full hearts, they were able to communicate easily. They, looking for the truth, and he, teaching the truth, were right for each other. When he taught in line with the principles of the truth, they were able to comprehend quickly and to know step by step following him until they penetrated the truth clear through. Their gilesas, however many or few they had, all dissolved completely away. The cycle of rebirth was overturned to their complete relief. This is how it is when a person who truly knows and truly sees explains the tamma, Whether it's an aspect of the tamma dealing with the world or with the tamma itself, what he says is bound to be certain because he has seen it directly with his own eyes heard it with his own ears, touched it with his own heart. So when he remembers it and teaches it, how can he be wrong? He can't be wrong. For example, the taste of salt. Once we have known with our tongue that it's salty, and we speak directly from the saltiness of the salt, how can we be wrong? Or the taste of hot peppers. The pepper is hot. It touches our tongue and we know this pepper is hot. When we speak with the truth, this pepper is hot, just where can we be wrong? So it is with knowing the tamma. When we practice to the stage where we should know, we have to know, step by step. Knowing the tamma happens at the same moment as abandoning gilesa. When gilesa dissolves away, the brightness that has been obscured will appear in that very instant. The truth appears clearly. Gilesa, which is a truth, we know clearly. We then cut it away with the path, mindfulness, and banya, which is a principle of the truth. And then we take the truth and teach it so that those who are intent on listening will be sure to understand. The Buddha taught the Tamma in 84,000 sections, kanta, but they aren't in excess of our five kantas, with the jitta in charge, responsible for good and evil and for dealing with everything that makes contact. Even though there may be as many as 84,000 sections to the Tamma, they were taught in line with the attributes of the Chitta, of Kilesa, and of the Tamma itself, for the sake of living beings with their differing temperaments. 
the Buddha taught exclusively 84,000 sections of the Tamma so that those of differing temperaments could put them into practice and straighten out their gilesas. And we should make ourselves realize that those who listen to the Tamma from those who have truly known and truly seen from the mouth of the Buddha, the Arahants, or meditation masters, should be able to straighten out their gilesas and asava at the same time they are listening. This is a point that doesn't depend on time or place. All the Tamma comes down to the Jitta. The Jitta is a highly appropriate vessel for each level of the Tamma. In teaching the Tamma, what are the things entangling and embroiling the Jitta that are necessary to describe so that those who listen can understand and let go? There are elements, kanthas, and the unlimited sights, sounds, smells, tastes, and tactile sensations outside us, which make contact with the eye, ear, nose, tongue, body, and heart within us. Thus it is necessary to teach both about things outside and about things inside, because the jitta can become deluded and attached both outside and inside. It can love and hate both the outside and the inside. When we teach in line with the causes and effects both inside and out, in accordance with the principles of the truth, the jitta that contemplates or investigates exclusively in line with the principles of truth has to know step by step and be able to let go. Once we know something, we can let it go. That puts an end to our problem of having to prove or investigate the matter again. Whatever we understand is no longer a problem, because once we have understood, we let go. We keep letting go, because our understanding has reached the truth of those various things in full measure. The investigation of the Tamma, on the levels in which it should be narrow, has to be narrow. On the levels in which it should be wide-ranging, it has to be wide-ranging, in line with the full level of the jitta and the tamma. So when the heart of the meditator should stay in a restricted range, it has to be kept in that range. For example, in the beginning stages of the training, the jitta is filled with nothing but cloudiness and confusion at all times, and can't find any peace or contentment. We thus have to force it to stay in a restricted range, for example, with the meditation word butto, or with the in-and-out breath, so as to gain a footing with its meditation theme, so that stillness can form a basis or a foundation for the heart, so that it can set itself up for the practice that is to follow. We first have to teach the jitta to withdraw itself from its various preoccupations, using whichever meditation theme it finds appealing, so that it can find a place of rest and relaxation through the stillness. Once we have obtained enough stillness from our meditation theme to form an opening onto the way, we begin to investigate. Banya and awareness begin to branch out in stages, or to widen their scope, until they have no limit. When we reach an appropriate time to rest the jitta through the development of samadhi, we focus on tranquility using our meditation theme as we have done before, without having to pay attention to banya in any way at that moment. We set our sights on giving rise to stillness with the meditation theme that has previously been coupled with the heart, or that we have previously practiced for the sake of stillness. We focus in on that theme, step by step, with mindfulness in charge, until stillness appears, giving peace and contentment. This is called resting the jitta by developing samadhi. When the jitta withdraws from its resting place, banya has to unravel and investigate things. Let it investigate whatever it should at that particular time or stage, until it understands the matter. When Banya begins to move into action as a result of its being reinforced by the strength of Samadhi, its investigations have to grow more and more wide-ranging, step by step. This is where Banya is wide-ranging. This is where the Tamma is wide-ranging. The more resourceful our Banya, the more its investigations spread, until it knows the causes and effects of phenomena as they truly are. Its doubts then disappear, and it lets go in stages, in line with the levels of mindfulness and Banya suited to removing the various kinds of Gelesa step by step from the heart. The jitta then gradually retreats into a more restricted range, as it sees necessary, all on its own, without needing to be forced as before, because once it has investigated and known in line with the way things really are, what is there left to be entangled with, to be concerned about? The extent to which it is concerned or troubled is because of its lack of understanding. 
when it understands with the banya that investigates and unravels to see the truth of each particular thing, the jitta withdraws and lets go of its concerns. It goes further and further inward until its scope grows more and more restricted to the elements, the kantas, and then exclusively to the jitta itself. At this stage, the jitta works in a restricted scope because it has cut away its burdens in stages. What is there in the elements and the kantas? Analyze them down into their parts, body, feelings, sanya, sankara, and vinyarna, until you have removed your doubts about any of them. For example, when you investigate the body, an understanding of feeling automatically follows. Or when you investigate feelings, this leads straight to the body, to sanya, sankara, and vinyarna, which have the same sorts of characteristics, because they come from the same current of the jitta. To put it briefly, the Buddha taught that each of the five kantas is a complete treasury or complete heap of the three characteristics. What do they have that's worth holding on to? The physical elements, the physical heap, all physical forms, are simply heaps of the elements. Vedana, Sanya, Sankara, and Vinyarna are all mere mental phenomena. They appear, blip, 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 and disappear in an instant. What value or substance can you get from them? Banya penetrates further and further in. It knows the truth which goes straight to the heart, and it lets go with that straight to the heart knowledge. In other words, it lets go straight from the heart. When the knowledge goes straight to the heart, it lets go straight from the heart. Our job narrows in, narrows in, as the work of Banya dictates. This is the way it is when investigating and knowing the path of the jitta that involves itself with various preoccupations. We come in knowing, we come in letting go step by step, cutting off the paths of the tigers that used to roam about looking for food, as in the phrase from the Tamma textbooks, cutting off the paths of the tigers that roam about looking for food. We cut them out from the paths of the eye, ear, nose, tongue, and body, along which they used to roam, involving themselves with sights, sounds, smells, tastes, and tactile sensations, gathering up poisonous food and bringing it in to burn the heart. Banya thus has to roam about, investigating the body, feelings, sanya, sankara, and vinyarna by probing inward, probing inward, along the paths that the tigers and leopards like to follow, so as to cut off the paths along which they used to go looking for food. The Buddha teaches us to probe inward, cutting off the paths until we have the tigers caged. In other words, avidda, which is like a tiger, converges in at the one jitta. All Gilesas and Asava converge in at the one jitta. They can't go out roaming freely, looking for food as they did before. The jitta of Avidda, you could say that it's like a football, because Banya unravels it, stomps on it, kicks it back and forth, until it is smashed a bit, until the Gilesa of Avidda is smashed inside. This is the level of the jitta where Gelesa converges, so when Banya unravels it, it's just like a football that is stomped and kicked. It gets kicked back and forth among the kantas until it's smashed apart by Banya. When the conventional jitta is smashed apart, the jitta released is fully revealed. Why do we say the conventional jitta and the jitta released? Do they become two separate jittas? Not at all. It's still the same jitta. When conventional realities, gilesas and asava, rule it, that's one state of the jitta. But when it's washed and wrung out by banya until that state of jitta is smashed apart, then the true jitta, the true tamma which can stand the test, doesn't disappear with it. The only things that disappear are anitta, dukkha, and anatta that had infiltrated the jitta. Because gilesas and asava, no matter how refined, are simply conventions. Anitza, Dukkha, and Anatta. When these things disappear, the true Jitta, above and beyond convention, can then appear to its full extent. This is what's called the Jitta released. This is what's called the pure Jitta, completely cut off from all connections and continuations. All that remains is simple awareness, utterly pure. We can't say at what point in our body this simple awareness is centered. Before, it was a prominent point that we could know and see clearly. For example, in Samadhi, we knew that it was centered in the middle of the chest. Our awareness was pronounced right there. The stillness was pronounced right there. 
The brightness, the radiance of the jitta was pronounced right there. We could see it clearly without having to ask anyone. All those whose jittas have centered into the foundation of samadhi find that the center of what knows is really pronounced right here in the middle of the chest. They won't argue that it's in the brain or whatever, as those who have never experienced the practice of samadhi are always saying. But when the jitta becomes a pure jitta, that center disappears. And so we can't say that the jitta is above or below or in any particular spot. Because it's an awareness that is pure, an awareness that is subtle and profound, above and beyond any and all conventions. Even so, we are still veering off into conventions when we say that it's extremely refined, which doesn't really fit the truth, because of course the notion of extreme refinement is a convention. We can't say that this awareness lies high or low, or where it has a point or a center, because it doesn't have one at all. All there is is awareness with nothing else infiltrating it. Even though it's in the midst of the elements and kanthas with which it used to be mixed, it's not that way anymore. It now lies worlds apart. We now can know clearly that the kanthas are kanthas, the jitta is jitta, the body is body. Vedana, sanya, sankara, and vinyarna are each separate kanthas. But as for feelings in that jitta, they no longer exist. But as for feelings in that jitta, they no longer exist. Ever since the jitta gained release from all gilesa. Therefore, the three characteristics, which are convention incarnate, don't exist in that jitta. The jitta doesn't partake of feeling, apart from the ultimate ease, Paramang Sulkang, that is its own nature. And the ultimate ease here is not a feeling of ease. When the Buddha teaches that Nibbana is the ultimate ease, the term ultimate ease is not a feeling of ease like the feelings or moods of the jitta still defiled, or the feelings of the body that are constantly appearing as dukkha and sulkha. The ultimate ease is not a feeling like that. Those who practice should take this point to heart and practice so as to know it for themselves. That will be the end of the question, in line with the tamma that the Buddha says is sandirtiko, to be seen for oneself, and on which he lays no exclusive claims. Thus we cannot say that the jitta absolutely pure has any feeling. This jitta has no feeling. The term ultimate ease refers to an ease by the very nature of purity, and so there can't be any anitsa, dukkha, or anatta found infiltrating that ultimate ease at all. Nibbana is constant. The ultimate ease is constant. They are one and the same. The Buddha says that Nibbana is constant. The ultimate ease is constant. The ultimate void is constant. They are all the same thing. But the void of Nibbana lies beyond convention. It's not void in the way the world supposes it to be. If we know clearly, we can describe and analyze anything at all. If we don't understand, we can talk from morning till night and be wrong from morning till night. There is no way we can be right because the jitta isn't right. No matter how much we may speak in line with what we understand to be right in accordance with the tamma, if the jitta that is acting isn't right, how can we be right? It's as if we were to say, Nibbana is the ultimate ease, Nibbana is the ultimate void, to the point where the words are always in our mouth and in our heart. If the jitta is a jitta with kilesas, it can't be right. When the jitta isn't right, nothing can be right. Once the jitta is right, though, then even when we don't say anything, we are right, because that nature is already right. Whether or not we speak, we're right. Once we reach the level where we're right, there's no wrong. This is the marvel that comes from the practice of the religion. The Buddha taught only as far as this level and didn't teach anything further. It's in every way the end of conventions, the end of formulations, the end of gilesa, the end of suffering and dukkha. This is why he didn't teach anything further, because this is the point at which he fully aimed, the full level of the jitta and of the tamma. Before he totally entered Nibbana, his last instructions were, Monks, I exhort you. Formations are constantly arising and ceasing. 
Investigate formations that are arising and disbanding, or arising and ceasing, with non-complacency. That was all. He closed his mouth, and never said anything again. In this teaching, which has the rank of a final instruction, how should we understand or interpret the word formation, samkara? What kind of formations does it refer to? We could take it as referring to outer formations or inner formations, and we wouldn't be wrong. But at that moment, we can be fairly certain that those who came to listen to the Buddha's final instructions at the final hour were practicing monks with high levels of mental attainment, from arahants on down. So I would think that the main point to which the Buddha was referring was inner formations that form thoughts in the citta and disrupt the citta at all times. He taught to investigate the arising and ceasing of these formations with non-complacency. In other words, to investigate with mindfulness and banya at all times. These formations cover the cosmos. We could, if we wanted to, analyze the word formations as outer formations, trees, mountains, animals, people, but this wouldn't be in keeping with the level of the monks gathered there, nor would it be in keeping with the occasion, the Buddha's last moments before total Nibbana, in which he gave his exhortation to the Sangha, the ultimate teaching at the final hour. His final exhortation dealing with formations, given as he was about to enter total Nibbana, must thus refer specifically to the most refined formations in the heart. Once we comprehend these inner formations, how can we help but understand their basis, what they arise from? We'll have to penetrate into the wellspring of the cycle of rebirth, the jitta of avidza. This is the way to penetrate to the important point. Those who have reached this level have to know this. Those who are approaching it in stages, who haven't fully reached it, still know this clearly because they are investigating the matter, which is what the Buddha's instructions, given in the midst of that important stage of events, were all about. This, I think, would be in keeping with the occasion in which the Buddha spoke. Why? Because ordinarily, when the citta has investigated to higher and higher levels, these inner formations... The various thoughts that form in the citta are very crucial to the investigation because they appear day and night and are at work every moment inside the citta. A citta reaching the level where it should investigate inner phenomena must thus take these inner formations as the focal point of its investigation. This is a matter directly related to the Buddha's final instructions. The ability to overthrow avidya must follow on an investigation focused primarily on inner formations. Once we have focused in, focused in, down to the root of Gelesa and have then destroyed it, these formations no longer play any role in giving rise to Gelesa again. Their only function is to serve the purposes of the Tamma. We use them to formulate Tamma for the benefit of the world. In teaching Tamma, we have to use thought formations, and so formations of this sort become tools of the Tamma. Now that we have given the Kantas a new ruler, the thought formations which were forced into service by Avidya have now become tools of the Tamma, tools of a pure heart. The Buddha used these thought formations to teach the world to formulate various expressions of the Tamma. The tamma we have mentioned here doesn't exist solely in the past, in the time of the Buddha, or solely in the future in a way that would deny hope to those who practice rightly and properly. It lies among our own kantas and jitta, in our body and jitta. It doesn't lie anywhere else other than in the bodies and jittas of human beings, women and men. The gelesas, the path and purity all lie right here in the heart. They don't lie in that time or period way back when, or with that person or this. They lie with the person who practices, who is using mindfulness and manya to investigate right now. Why? Because we are all aiming at the tamma. We are aiming at the truth, just like the tamma, the truth that the Buddha taught then, and that always holds to the principle of being Madsima. In the center, 
not leaning toward that time or this, not leaning toward that period or this place. It's a tamma always keeping to an even keel, because it lies in the center of our elements and kantas. Madhima, in the center, or always just right for curing gilesa. So please practice correctly in line with this tamma. You will see the results of madhima, a tamma just right, always and everywhere, appearing as I have said. Nibbana, the ultimate ease, will not in any way lie beyond this knowing heart. And so I'll ask to stop here.